I'm recording, yes. Um, so, yeah, if you were here yesterday, I started talking about this right before the bell rang. And, um, okay, this is kind of creepy, okay? You're familiar with uh, vampires? Yeah. Okay, they're not real, right? Yeah. Now, okay, so, when you're a mass, okay, and you are receiving communion, okay, <laughs> you are getting the the body and blood of Christ, right? Okay. Now there was a myth, myth that went back centuries. All right. Now I've been talking about uh, anti-Semitism. Okay. Traditional anti-Semitism is based on what? Religion. Thank you. Modern anti-Semitism is based on what? Race. Okay. So either way, the Jews don't fit. Okay. In a Christian Europe with the religion, and then as a race, as we move into ethnic nationalism in Germany, Volkish nationalism, and the Nazis, the Jews don't fit because they're not German. You understand? They're not ethnic German. Now, they're German. They're just not ethnic German. You with me? So, guys, dating back, Jews had been accused of doing some horrible things. Okay? And this is based on the view that Jews hate Christianity. And that they're not truly human. And they need remedies because they're not truly human. And that remedy is the blood of Christian children. Now, as I was explaining to my students, uh, you've heard of kosher foods. Okay, kosher meats. So if you are Jewish, okay, and you're going to eat meat, the meat has to be prepared a certain way. The animal has to be killed a certain way, and that is by slitting the throat of the animal, draining the blood from the animal, and then you can prepare the meat. Now, this myth kind of disappeared in the 1600s, but in the 1800s and 1880s, there were a couple of sensational trials. Now, when we talk about sensational trials, think of O.J. Simpson. We've all heard of the O.J. Simpson. So we're still talking about it 25 years later, okay? Because it was kind of, it was in every newspaper, it was every headline. Well, guys, this was in Hungary and in Kiev and Ukraine. There were a couple sensational cases where it was thought that Jews had abducted Christian children and murdered them for ritual purposes, okay? And they went to trial. You can find references to these trials in American newspapers in the 1880s. From Europe and Russia. Okay. Now, in the case in Hungary, which became very, a 14-year-old girl disappeared on Easter Sunday. And two Jews were charged with her murder. While they were on trial, they finally found the body. And when they found the body, the charges were dismissed. Because the 14-year-old girl was dead, but her throat had not been cut. So it couldn't have been a ritual murder. But it's too late. Everybody's already talking about it. These Jews are abducting Christian children and drinking their blood. It just adds to this us versus them mentality against Jews. Okay, And as I explained in my class yesterday, guys, the number one religious minority or ethnic minority in this country that faces more persecution than any other is not Muslims, is not African Americans, it's not Hispanics, it's not Catholics, it's Jews in this country today.
Look up F FBI statistics. Go to Europe. It's worse today, even after what we went through with the Nazis and the Holocaust and all the education that we've had. over what happened to them. It's still like that. Okay. I found this article recently. This is dated from 2014. A French Jew is cleared of blood libel 344 years after execution. They were burned at the stake. Okay. For being accused of ritual murder. Okay. So, this all just leads into this anti-Semitism, okay, which has been going on for centuries, okay? So, back to the notes. Okay, yesterday uh, I went through how Hitler came to power and how he became dictator, okay? So, Article 48 of the German Constitution, where's my... Let's get some lights on, going back here. You can see. Ambiance. Turn that little button on. Ambiance. Gosh, that seems so long. You guys have better eyes than I do because I can't see that. From back then. Right. Okay. So, guys, 11 different political parties in the German Reichstag. The Nazis got 36% plurality in 1932. Okay. So, you've got a weak, divided government. The German economy is in turmoil. The German mark is literally almost worthless. Okay, and I mentioned this in the video yesterday. I didn't talk to my class about this. But uh, when they said you have to bring a wheelbarrow full of money in to buy a loaf of bread, that's not an exaggeration. Okay, so you saw hyperinflation in Germany. Okay, millions of unemployed in Germany, goods were scarce. Germany was leaderless, hungry, and hopeless. And this is how Hitler came to power. Okay. Now, this is Joseph Goebbels. He is going to be the minister of propaganda for Adolf Hitler. Okay. Goebbels will be with Hitler from the very beginning to the very end, literally to the very end. There's a really good movie about the last days of Adolf Hitler called Downfall. Have you guys seen this movie, Downfall? Okay, it's, it's very well done. And the guy that is cast to play, the actor that's cast for Goebbels, is this very, uh, he's got these dark eyes, he's kind of sinister. I mean, it's just like a perfect casting. Um, Goebbels and his wife, in the bunker with Hitler as the Russians invaded Berlin will take the lives of their children and the lives of themselves so that they would not be captured by the Russians. Okay? And then as the story goes, Hitler will... Uh, he marries his mistress, Eva Braun, uh, and he will shoot his dog and... They will both take suicide pills and shoot. Sh he will shoot her in the head and shoot himself in the head so that the Russians don't capture him. Okay. That's one story. Okay. All right. So, what we're going to see, guys, is German Nazification, okay, where the country will be Nazified, okay? Now, this is the inside the Reichstag. So they've redecorated, okay, with the swastikas and different um, banners and so forth. And they created a one-party state. So first they arrested all the communists, then 
they got rid of all the other parties. So it's just the Nazi. Hitler's here, okay? And then you can see everybody saluting him. And then this is him receiving the salute from all those others, okay? Now, almost immediately, Jews are going to start to be um, oppressed, okay? And that will, that will evolve over time. So have you guys heard of the final solution for Jews? Okay. Well, the final solution is to kill, exterminate all European Jews. Okay. The final solution for Jews really isn't fully developed until about 1944. Okay. It evolves over time. Okay. So at one point, in 1940, they actually talked about, because they just wanted to get rid of the Jews. They wanted them gone. And they actually talked about rounding up German Jews and European Jews and sending them to the island of Madagascar, just getting them out of Europe. This was actually thought of as an option. Now, logistically, this would be nearly impossible. Okay, we're talking about millions of people. All right. So um, it's something that evolves over time, the final solution. Okay. So the first are going to try and get Jews to leave. Okay. Hitler had given the Germans somebody to blame for their problem. Okay. You guys can't read that. not much better. You're going to have to look this up on the notes, okay? They're on the uh, module. I'm turning the light back on. All right. So, they were very good at propaganda, right? Spectacular meetings with speeches of glory and hate. Okay, glory for Germany so that they would return to the rightful place in the world in the sun, okay? This really appealed to those that were unemployed, those that were hurting. Now, respectable Germans watched this go on. Okay? They didn't stop it. Now, they have an electoral process like we do. They get to vote. Okay? And again, Hitler only won 36, the Nazis only won 36% of the seats. Okay, so this was not a majority of Germans that supported Hitler. But because of their parliamentary system, guys, yeah, it's going to allow him to come to power, okay? His thugs, wearing brown shirts, would beat up opponents, assassinate enemies, and then they would start building concentration camps, okay? Now, these concentration camps weren't just for Jews. They were for anybody that was anti-Nazi, okay? It could be Catholics, it could be Protestants, Jews, anybody that was anti the Nazi party, okay? They were placed in our... In, concentration camps. Now guys, in the first camps that they built, what they really wanted the Jews to do was leave. So they told the Jews, they said, if you're in these camps, we'll let you leave the camp and leave Germany. You can take a thousand marks with you. Which at that point was not very much. Now this would require them to leave their homeland, leave their homes, leave their businesses, everything behind, and flee the country. Some did. Others did not. Okay, so most of those people would rot away in the concentration camps over time. Okay. Now, as far as society goes in Germany, they set up the church. Okay, now, Germany has both Protestant and Catholics. Okay. And basically, they were told what they were allowed to say and what they weren't allowed to say from the pulpit, okay? And there would be people watching them from the pews to make sure that the priests or pastors didn't violate you know, this whole thing. And people, oh, look at that. Looking at me right over here. There's what I'm looking for right here. Okay. 
I picked this up when I was in London back in 99 uh, at the British Imperial Museum. And this really does a good job of explaining uh, how Hitler really um, brought the Nazi ideology into um, every, oops, everyday life for the Germans. Okay. I want to cover a little bit of this with you. Ooh. There's a German term. Do we have any German students in here? Took German? Not many students do, do they? Yeah, got that, got that. Steps to the dictatorship, got that. The party. Ah, here it is. Okay. Uh, Nazification actually has a German term. It's called Gleichel, Gleichel Tung, okay, which means equalizing. Okay, is a coordinated effort of propaganda, terror, intimidation, Nazi infiltration of local and state governments, education, art, design, and politics. Every aspect of society, the Nazis infiltrate. Okay. They eliminated the other political parties like I talked about, okay? Um, and then, like, guys, right after he took over, they had what was called the Night of Long Knives. So anybody that Hitler thought was a threat to him in his own party, he had them killed, okay? And these are people that really helped him get to where he was, but he thought they were a threat, okay? So he had them killed. This is what dictators do. They become paranoid. Okay. So, um, education in the Third Reich. Okay. Um, curriculum for the schools was given. Every, every teacher had to be part of the Nazi teacher union. Okay. This started in, in 1933-34. Organized schools in the Volkish, Volkish principles, okay, of ethnic principles, German principles. Teachers had to use the uh, uh, required curriculum of the Nazis. What did they teach? They taught nationalism, racial ideology, racial science, that there's no difference of opinion in school. Everybody fo follows the party line. Greek culture, they did teach. Military heroes. Every disaster in human history was blamed on whom? The Jews. Okay. Uh, then you have the Hitler Youth, okay? So if you had school that day and there was a Hitler Youth program, you would be told to go to the Hitler Youth program, okay? And the Hitler Youth started about age 10, okay? So the boys would go, okay, from age 10 to 18, all German boys. By 1936, it was mandatory. In 1932, they had 100,000, okay? But by 36, it was mandatory. From 10 to 14, the boys would be have intense indoctrination, okay? Uh, they would play war games, do recycling, physical fitness, that sort of thing. Once they turned four or 15, they would learn how to repair engines, learn how to fire weapons, learn how to march. Uh, they do things like uh, teaching them how aerodynamics, how to fly planes, uh, that sort of thing. For the girls, uh, you had 10 to 14, which was called Jung Model, okay? Um, and for the girls, they would just teach them things, you know, that girls, you know, they teach them things like how to cook, uh, how to care for children, that sort of thing, because they're training them to be mothers, okay? Because after the age of 14, they're expected to get married between 15 and 17 and start having children. What they're doing is they're having children for the fatherland. The more children they have, the more soldiers Hitler will have. The more boys they have, the more soldiers they will have. And they actually had contests about how many children they could have. And if you had a certain number of children and a number of them were boys, you actually got to have dinner with the Fuhrer. The Fuhrer, the leader, Adolf Hitler. Okay. 
Now, they were very strict about premarital sex and stuff like that. Morality. They were very strict. Okay, so from 17 to 21, for girls, for women, young women, is Glaub and Schonheit, which is faith and beauty. Physical fitness, group activities for the women, and, of course, child prayer. Okay. So because everybody was taught the same thing, basically they replaced family and school with the Hitler Youth. It was anti-intellectual. They did not want you to think for yourself. Do you understand? Anti-intellectual. Okay. The students were equal to the teachers. So if the teachers were not towing the party line, they were told to tell on their teachers. If the parents were not towing the party line, they were told to tell on their parents. Loyalty, unquestioned loyalty to the father and the leader above all else. Community, commitment, obedience, and service. No individuality, no independence. And as I said, unquestioned loyalty to Hitler and the state. Basically, Germany created a generation of stupid people that could not think for themselves and would follow orders. No problem-solving skills. Nobody's thinking outside of the box here. Okay? And guys, doggone it, if you look at this country, and you look at all the inventions. Now, are there inventions in other parts of the world? Yes. Okay. But if you look at our education system and the amount of flexibility that teachers used to have in this country, we have so many more controls on our teachers today than we've ever had. All this testing that you guys have to do and have to do over the years, there's no child left behind crap, okay? It's destroying education, okay? You need flexibility in education. You need students to be able to explore on their own, to think outside the box, okay? If everything is in a box, then nobody thinks outside the box. So if you look at some of our most famous inventors, what did they do? They dropped out of school. Now, I'm not saying you drop out of school. Okay. But think about it. Okay. Did Bill Gates finish college? Did Mark Zuckerberg finish college? What about Tom Edison? Okay. Education is good. You want to be an engineer, you need the education. You want to be a doctor, you need the, the education. You want to be an inventor, you're not going to learn that in college. Okay? You want to be an entrepreneur, yeah, some education is good for that. But you're going to do that outside of school. You're not going to do that in school. Okay? So college is not, education is not the answer to everything. But yes, you need to learn how to do arithmetic. Okay? If you want to invent something like lights out, you're going to need to understand calculus and trigonometry and so forth. Okay? If you're going that direction. All right? Okay. I just worry about our education system. All right. Ooh. That's blood. Red blood cells. So we've been talking about Hitler, right? A lot about Hitler. And just how awful Hitler was, right? Most destructive dictator of modern times. But let me tell you something. In the 20th century, we've had dictators far worse than Hitler when it comes to death tolls. Okay? And we're going to talk about some of them. Okay? We're going to talk about Uncle Joe. That'd be Uncle Joseph Stalin. 
All right, now I got a lot of this information from a website called killtally.com. There's Joseph Stalin, okay? Now, during World War II, in the lead up to World War II, when Stalin took over, they started using what were called five-year plans. They did away with private property in the Soviet Union. Okay, so if you were a farmer prior to the communists taking over, Whatever you produced on your land, you could eat for you and your family. And then anything you had left over, what could you do with it? Sell it for a profit. And then if you did really good at farming, you could use that profit to buy more land or buy another mule or another oxen so that you could grow more food and make a bigger profit. But that wasn't allowed anymore. So from Moscow and the capital, they had bureaucrats, government bureaucrats. They were telling farmers, no longer do you own this land, but you still have to work this land. And these people over here, they're gonna help you work on this land too. And this is what you're gonna plant, this is when you're gonna plant it, and this is when you're gonna harvest it. And whatever food's left over, hopefully you have enough to feed yourself. The government's going to take the food and share it with the people. Because this is communism. And you don't get to make a big profit. You know what that led to? Massive starvation. We are talking about millions of people starving to death, needlessly. Prior to this, Russia had enough food, but now the people didn't, and the government took what food there was. So, approximately 20 million for Stalin, including up to 14 and a half million needlessly starved to death, at least 1 million executed for political offenses. Now, guys, we talk about political correctness, right? You know what political correctness is, right? You have to use the right words. Yes? Or you might lose your job if you use the wrong word. You say the wrong thing that's politically incorrect. Okay? That's where the term comes from, ladies and gentlemen. Political incorrectness comes from Soviet Union under Joseph Stalin. Because if you said something that was against the party, that was politically incorrect, you would disappear. Now, I know you guys have read 1984. And when you read 1984, they didn't talk about people disappearing. They said they just vaporized, like they never existed. And you had the thought police. Not the speech police, but the thought police. Okay, the Ministry of Truth. This is what Orwell is writing about. What's happening here. Okay. It's freaking dangerous to have speech codes to stifle people's speech in the name of political correctness, in the name of not hurting somebody else's feelings. Your feelings aren't protected by the Constitution, people. You have the right to offend each other. It's dangerous when you prevent people from being able to do that. Now, as Christians, I don't recommend you go out and offend people. Don't be kind to others. Okay? But the fact that you're not allowed to is dangerous for mankind. These people often were sent to the gulag. At least nine and a half more pe million people deported, exiled, imprisoned in work camps. Many of the estimated five million sent to the gulag, never to return again alive. Other estimates place the number of deported at 28 million, including 18 million to the gulag. We don't know for sure because the Soviet Union was around till 1990, and they didn't really offer up that information to the public. Now, the gulag is in Siberia. 
up here. Okay, so you go there, you commit a, poli a political offense. Okay, they put you on trial, which is just a show trial, and then they ship you out. They come get you in the middle of the night. Have you heard of the KGB? The KGB is the secret police. They could be anywhere. Now, if you go into the 1950s and 60s in East Germany, after World War II, East Germany became communist. They had the secret police that were called the Stasi. Okay? And they would listen. They would wiretap your home. You never knew who the secret police were. They're secret. It could be your next door neighbor. It could be your sibling. It could be an aunt and uncle. It could be your spouse that is reporting to the government on your activities. In East Germany, when communism collapsed, they opened up the archives so that people could go in and see if they were if there was a file on them by the government, like if the government had been spying on them, and then they could find out who was the government's contact that was spying on you. If people found out that their best friends, their neighbors, and even their spouses were spying on them for the government. Yeah, that hurts some relationships there. Okay, they opened it up. Now in the Soviet Union, they didn't do that, okay? Do they have the secret police in China right now? Better believe they do. Okay, when we went and adopted Lily, we had to spend two weeks in China. Okay, and the first week before we picked up Lily, uh, we were in Beijing, the capital, and it was the Chinese New Year, so there were tons of people out there because uh, Chinese people doing what we were doing, going to all the tourist spots, and we were going to the forbidden. We were in the forbidden city, and it was a bunch of you know white Americans. And uh, we had a Chinese tour guide. And so we're going around, and she's showing us all these different things and explaining them to us in English. And then this woman walks up, this Chinese woman. She's got on a black leather coat, long one, down, down, black boots, guy dressed all in black. And she's got this stern look on her face. And she just like, Starts hanging out with our group for about 30 minutes. And I could tell our interpreter, our tour guide, was nervous because this woman was standing with our group. And I'm like talking to this other guy from Texas. I'm like, dude, who's the dragon lady? <laughs> <laughs> she was probably secret police. Okay? Making sure that that tour guide was, you know, not saying the wrong things. Okay, I don't know about you guys. I don't want to live in that society. Okay, this stuff's dangerous and it leads to the deaths of millions of people. Okay, we have to allow each other to have different opinions in this country. All right, so you don't want to go to Siberia, guys. It's freaking cold up there. And basically, they would just work you until you die. I mean, at one point, Stalin's trying to build a canal from St. Petersburg to Moscow. And they're just bringing in workers. And they're just working them, working and then they die, and they just bury them in the, in the dirt next to the canal. One after another. Just work and work and work. Bury them. I mean, it's, it's harsh. Okay? So Stalin is responsible for way more deaths than Adolf Hitler. But why don't we talk about Stalin more? Why don't we talk about the communism? Because guys, in China, there's another leader named Mao. This is Mao. This is his little red book. When I was in China, I bought two copies. It gives you all the communist propaganda and stuff you want in it, okay? Bought two copies, one for me and one for the only person in the school that's ever fought against communism. Who's that? No. Coach Lobon. Okay. You guys know Coach Lobon? 
you guys know he fought in Vietnam? Did you know he was an Army Ranger in Vietnam? You ever see a movie about Vietnam and uh, the helicopters? You know, they bring them in on the helicopters, they get off, and they fight, and then they get back on the helicopters, hopefully alive. He was one of those guys. Okay? He was drafted, living in Hayes, Kansas, going to Fort Hayes State. Got drafted. Okay? He spent two years in Vietnam. Okay? He's still suffering the effects of that. Okay? So I brought him a little red book. Okay? Mao in China. We don't know for sure, but estimates go as high as 80 million people. You had the great leap forward after the communists took over in 1948. And then in the 60s, you had the cultural revolution. Guys, you have to change the culture if you want people to believe something. Okay? So they had to get rid of people that thought differently. China has an incredible history. You guys studied a little bit of it with the, the dynasties and, and so forth, right? It's just a long Incredible history, okay? That's all washed out. You got to change the way people think, okay? And if they're not willing to change the way they think, you kill them. So who were they killing? They were, te they were killing teachers, professors, artists, historians, anybody who thought differently, didn't think the way they wanted them to. Re-education. If you're not willing to be re-educated, you're dead. 80 million. So between Stalin and Mao, we don't have to talk about Ho Chi Minh or Castro or Kim Il-sung in North Korea. But in the 20th century, guys, you could attribute close to 100 million deaths to the communists. Why aren't we talking about that? Instead of Hitler, everybody wants to do Hitler. Everybody wants to make movies about Hitler and the Holocaust. Why aren't we talking more about communism? Why doesn't Hollywood do more anti-communist movies? Yeah. We did. We fought a physical war against Hitler. We fought a physical war against Korea and Vietnam. Would it have had anything to do with some people in this country supporting the ideas of communism? Like, you know, people that own Hollywood studios and such. That, you know, are sympathetic to the ideas of communism, i.e. socialism. Who owns the major Hollywood studios? Do you have any idea? <laughs> these big media companies, these big publishing companies. You ever heard of DreamWorks? You ever watched a movie done by DreamWorks? You know who owns that? Who? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you this. That name ends in a bird. Steven Spielberg. You heard of him? Yeah. <laughs> Guys, Jews have done very well in this country. And they want you to remember the Holocaust. Okay? So you see a lot of uh, a lot of Jews in Hollywood. Okay. There's nothing wrong with that. And they want to make sure you remember the Holocaust, and there's nothing wrong with that. Because we should. And we should never let anything like that happen to any group of people. Which is happening to Muslims right now as we speak in China. They have camps right now with hundreds of thousands of Muslims in these camps in China. Our media isn't even talking about Rounding up the Muslims. Now, we went to war in 1995 in Kosovo 
Now we didn't put we didn't put soldiers on the ground. We, we did it by air to defend Muslims against Christians in Serbia. We went to war. NATO went to war. But nobody's talking about what's happening to the Muslims in China. Makes them feel uncomfortable. Dude, the Chinese communists are not our friend. Okay? Now, the Chinese people are our enemy. Okay? The Iranian people are not our enemy. But people have to wake up. I mean, our media in 1930s and 40s barely covered the Holocaust. And they knew it was going on. You go back and look at sightings of the Holocaust during the war by the New York Times, which is our paper of record. They basically ignored what was happening to the Jews in Europe. Okay. That's why I'm spending time on it, because nobody else will. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry. It just pisses me off, okay? All right, let's talk about this guy. Prince Yasahiko Asaka, okay? And we talked about this early, and I think a couple of you might be reading the book, The Rape of Man King, yes, okay? And so this was the guy that was in charge, all right? Now, I know this number fails in comparison to Stalin and Mao and Hitler, okay? But the methods that were used here and the sure atrocities against civilians here and women here should be noted. Now, I think I might have mentioned this, but it's worth mentioning. The Japanese believed in their own racial superiority. They thought they were superior to not all just Asian people, but all people. Okay. This is Emperor Hirohito. In the Japanese culture during this time period, Hirohito is the, the is a descendant of the sun god. Okay, so he is a godlike figure. These people will become fanatical, the Japanese. You want to talk about brainwashed? These people are brainwashed. This will become a very militaristic, rigid society in Japan. And they, as we already know, in 1931, go on the war path. Yes? In China. Okay? And then you got Mussolini. Kill tally. About 400,000 Italians were killed during World War II. And I will talk about soon the invasion of Ethiopia by, Itali by the Italians. Okay? which is basically a massacre. Okay. Mussolini talks about building a new Roman Empire. Okay. And he's going to try it out. Try, out. try out his military on the Ethiopian people. Okay. He's a thug. He's not harmless, though. Okay. And, of course, he's going to join forces with Adolf Hitler. For his own convenience. 35. All right, guys, sorry. Um, let me just look at this next slide and see what it says. Oh, that, that's, this is uh, Hideki Tocho. Uh, he's going to come to power of the Japanese military in 1940. And he will be the guy that gets permission from the emperor to attack us at Pearl Harbor. Tojo. This man will be executed for war crimes after the war. Okay. Okay, yeah, so next lecture, uh, what, Thursday, okay, I'll be talking about um, Ethiopia, okay, the invasion of Ethiopia, which is here, okay, and the continued expansion of the Japanese in China, okay, and then we move forward, uh, just foreshadow a little bit here, okay, we're going to be looking at Germany, uh, the Spanish Civil War, okay, and then American foreign policy as it pertains to what's going on overseas. Okay? Oh, all right. I get a break. 
See you guys. See you Thursday.